Hello, everybody, and welcome to round five of the European Team Championships. We're going to be, first of all, focusing on the English teams. So in the Open and the Women's section, we will also pop in on the um, Scottish, Irish and Welsh teams, which is quite easy today because the Scottish and Irish teams are playing against each other. All right, so what we're going to do is start off by having a quick look at all the games, uh, all the games from the English team that are going on at the moment, and then we will go into a little bit more detail um, in, well, probably each of the games. So here we go. First of all, um, we have, uh, this is England. Here we go against, it's, is it Slovenia today? Uh, Slovakia. Slovakia, sorry, Slovakia. That we've Yes, no, it's the women who've played Slovenia, isn't it? But yeah, it's Slovakia. We played Slovenia the other day, it's Slovakia. Um, so on board one, we have uh, Jogos Pechak against uh, Grandmaster Mickey Adams, who is black in this position. And Grandmaster Jogos Pechak, to be fair. Indeed, to yes. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, I don't know, I only really know one member of this Slovakian team particularly well, and that was from the... Um, unfortunate occurrence of being outplayed by him in what was otherwise quite a good tournament for me. So uh, they're board three, uh, Petenia I've, I've, I've played, but the other guys I don't know too well. I mean, I sort of know the older Slovak generation. This, again, is a fairly young team. This guy, I think, is, you know, 20-ish, something like that, maybe a little okay. more. But in general, this is a, a fairly... He looks older than that from his picture, doesn't he? Let me just, I, I, I don't know with these pictures. They're quite small. I, looked um, him up. I think he's 20. I think he's yeah. 20. If you say he looked older on air, he's going to get very upset. So. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, and um, so this and this looks to me. I mean, I I'm trying to remember how much Mickey plays the Tartakova Queen's Gambit of Black. This sort of feels like Mickey playing playing Nigel's weapon in a sense. This was Nigel's for a long time, but I'm pretty sure Mickey does this kind of thing too. And well, he's got a. It's a fairly typical Tartakova position, and it looks to me like you know Black is solid enough. White doesn't have particularly strong pressure against the hanging pawns, but he does have this nice square for a bishop on b5. And, you know, if that bishop got changed off, it would then probably convert into a nice square for the knight on b5. So white has that to sort of boast about. But otherwise, I guess this is fairly standard and fairly mm. fairly um, solid for black. But we'll come back and have a, a proper look at it in a moment and see how they got here. But for now, I just want to, I just want to take a little look at how things are going. I get a snapshot after an hour of how things are going. Okay, so we'll take a look at board two, maybe Luke? Yes, let's see Luke. Here we go. Right, so Luke here is playing white against Juraj Druska. Yes, so, well, um, this was a this was a Khan Sicilian and Luke played his four C4 move, which, I mean, you know, in terms of, People remembering that. I guess it happened a few times in one of the Carlson Annan matches, that kind of thing. I think it got sort of a little bit popular around there. Um, but it looks to me like Mickey has a pair of bishops and he's managed. I mean, often in this line, in, in these lines, you get sort of White gets the bishop pair, and, but gets some structural weakness as a result. Here, White doesn't have the structural weakness, but nonetheless, a sort of slight feeling that black's development is quite comfortable because the night well the knight on c2 could become a good piece you can sort of imagine scenarios where it might get in the way as well and the um you know white's trying to put a bishop on the long diagonal and make something mm -hmm. of the dark squares and if he managed to do that and you know doesn't lose space and time you can feel quite optimistic about the position but black black needs to think now about how to complete his development but you know, white's queen on c3. It reminds me a little bit of something like, I mean, not structurally maybe, because there's no c4 pawn, but the same sort of arguments as a queen c2 nimzo. So instead of having structural damage, white has a, you know, possibly mm. slightly premature development of the queen, and black has fairly easy piece play. But whether it amounts to compensation for the bishop pair, Luke will obviously try to prove that it doesn't. Yeah, I think I, I think I quite fancy it for white because just having those two bishops. You know, at a distance, but lining up against the black king. Yeah, no, if you can get them moving, then then we can be quite optimistic about this from Luke's point of view. If 
Well, it'd be very interesting to see what Black has planned for his next couple of moves. Because, you know, the, stra the strategy when you have development against a more permanent advantage like the Bishop Bear is to try and, mm. try and provide some disruption which actually amounts to something. You know, you have to get something a little bit tangible out yeah. of the next few moves, whether it's misplacing some white pieces or maybe even exchanging one of those bishops or something. You know, there are ways of trying to show that the development matters. But it's, you know, I'm not immediately seeing... I mean, one question, I imagine... Hi, Gawain. Oh, hi, Gawain. Okay, Gawain might be... Anyway, let's, let, if, we, if Gawain's here, well, let's, let's move on to the next one and then we'll come back and do more detail in a minute. Sure. Okay. So the next one is going to be David. Here we go. Well, I assume people will have realised the fact that Gawain is here. Is, uh, Gawain's having a Reassuringly informed them. Long-term strategic it. advantage without too much risk. Yeah, it's Luke. nice. Yeah, that's, it? that's yeah. certainly the hope. It's just a question of whether, I think, whether um, Black can do something a little bit to disrupt in the short term. But yes, there's a definitely a definitely a hope that that is the case. Okay, this one is a... I quite like what David's done here. I mean, there's lots of different versions of the um, advanced Karakhan. There's so many different versions. In some of them, you know, white just develops. This, this is kind of amongst, even amongst the kind of those based on the short systems, those with an early knight F3. Even amongst those, there are those where white kind of develops and then tries to exploit the opening of the position if black opens it up. But there's also those ones where white, tends to put a knight on b3 or something and actually try to prevent black from playing c5. And white did this here, but black's advance of the a-pawn, and we can go back and check in a minute whether white could have handled the bid after a5 differently, but white's actually allowed black's a-pawn to drive the knight back, and that, in, that has enabled black to play c5. And my kind of feeling about this, you get a slight sense of white played a system based around delaying c5 but now c5 has happened and that kind of makes me re I, I, I quite like this for black i don't i don't immediately sense that white's knight on c1 is doing something amazingly good and black doesn't have any of the sort of sharp dangerous things which sometimes accompany opening the position with c5 so i quite like this when i played mm -hmm. uh, so green saying white's last move doesn't look too doesn't look like the right thing uh, White's well, last move being what Bishop B5. Yeah, it's Bishop B5. Yeah, it's a strange move, Bishop B5. It it feels like it needs to be um, needs to be associated with a very specific idea, and and I haven't seen what it is yet. I have to admit. Yes. So Black's bringing Knight to C6, presumably, and you know one of the problems Black gets in the advanced cover count is situations where his pieces tread on each toe on each other's toes a bit. So the Knight and the Bishop one. Knight on g8, bishop on f8, quite often both want the e7 square. And black often has the task of handling that sort of slight pile up. But knight e7 to c6. Yep. Occasionally black plays knight to c8, but I don't see a need for that here. Knight to c6 and bishop e7. And it seems to me like black's looking very comfortable. Yep. When I played Petaini, he played a, a very interesting line of the um, exchange Karakhan with white okay. and, and got. I think quite a nice position right out of the opening, or at least a, a fairly interesting and different sort of position out of the opening. But I remember at the time that he also had the exchange in his uh, in his repertoire, and I think in my in my game for pre game preparation, I kind of guessed wrongly. So <laughs> it's okay. here it is today. Yeah. Okay. Right. Let's, Let's have a look at Ravi's. And now Ravi, yeah. Who I think we left yesterday when Ravi was still playing, but it was tending towards a draw, and he did indeed hold the draw as expected in that position. So here he is today, nurturing a um, what is usually a slight but tangible advantage in these lines of the Catalan. So this is uh, I'll come back and talk about this one later. This this is a line where because we're used in the Catalan to seeing Black playing a six and b five and developing the bishop that way. In this line, black plays, um, well, white has prevented b5, so black kind of plays bishop to d7 to c6 to develop it on the same diagonal, but actually with fewer weaknesses in a sense. And what black has then done, and what I think is probably the most solid way to play these lines, is to um, take on f3, play c6, and just keep the position very solid. So, you know, there's, there's a sort of slight Slav-like character to black's position here. And if black can play the move a5 in these things and white doesn't generate some really tangible play, then I kind of think tend to think that black is doing just fine. But, well, here Ravi has 
I mean, we'll come back and look at the detail again in a minute, but I quite like what Ravi has done so far. I think it. we should just point out the bishop on d4, I'm pretty sure, isn't on prees because quite simply white will play e3 against bishop takes d4, and then the queen on c7 would be overworked. So she would be... Um, oh, yes, defending the rook on... Yeah, when the bishop's driven away, she's defending the rook. She's also defending b7. Yeah. So I'm pretty sure that white is quite safe vis-a-vis -vis black taking on d4, in which case I suspect that black will play... I'm not sure. I, I suppose that he keeps the bishop if he has time to, and if he doesn't keep the bishop, then he plays knight d7, preventing structural damage. Mm. We shall see. I, I slightly prefer white, but this this line is kind of notoriously solid, and I need I would need to go and check to see whether black did something which might have been improved upon, because I don't remember white getting that white should get quite such a pleasant version as this, but it may be just that mm. when I had it. I feel it's, it's just, looking like it's sort of comfortable for Ravi, isn't it's it? It's very comfortable for white. I mean, I think this line is usually played as a, you know, there's, there's a fair degree of respect going on when black chooses this line. It means that they are placing, uh, not losing top of the priority list rather <laughs> than playing all out for, you know, it's a very, very solid system. And yeah. okay, when you're playing as well as Ravi's been playing lately, that's the sort of, Respect you do. Yep. By the way, Rafi is the senior player in this game. His opponent is only 18. So. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, well, so I, that's, I, I mean, I imagine they've come across each other before then. I, I, I played but I actually checked well, so. not, that I, not that I could see, I have to say. Yeah, okay. But maybe played yeah, it. So he's kept this bishop, which seems like, I mean, the only question was whether, I don't think white particularly wants to change the structure with knight c5. So I think, that, you know, black probably has time to go bishop e7 and knight d7. I think, you know, the... The opposite color bishops in a position which, from Black Black's point of view, hopefully isn't too, you know, dynamic. There isn't too direct and going to be an attack on the king or something. I guess the opposite color bishops is more likely to be a drawish feature than a, yeah, than a sort of dynamically dangerous yeah. feature for yeah. Black. So keeping the bishop makes sense. But okay, so I'm. Um, it's obviously a pleasant position for Ravi, but he has to try to make something of it, and this isn't easy. Okay, we'll now hop to the women's games. Um, okay, and so let's put on that one. Okay, and so this is against Turkey, um, and we've got uh, Katarzyna Tonma against Ekaterina Atalik, who actually, she's a, a regular foreign CL player, isn't she? I just, I've, she's a, she's a very strong and very experienced player. I mean, she is yeah. very much the senior player in, in an also, by the way, quite young Turkish team. Mm. Um, and that's that's been a bit of a pattern with Turkey over the years. I think they, you know, they're one of the quite ambitious countries, I think, when it comes to women's chess. And you tend to see players getting, you know, young players with promise are promoted into the national team relatively quickly to see what they can do. And so far, it's got to be said, I mean, to be honest, neither team here has found this a to easy tournament to find their mm. form. And actually, Ekaterina Athletic blundered her queen yesterday. So, okay. I mean, sort of, you know, she's a very experienced player and she's quite capable of putting that sort of thing behind her. But obviously, it never puts you in quite the, quite the <laughs> yes. best mood. Um, so, okay, but it looks it looks like she's um, kind of... I'm not quite sure what White did in the last couple of moves because at the point when White went E5, it looks to me like there may have been a slight... You know, there may have been some more interesting way to try and mm. capitalise on things. Now it looks like Black's getting her fair share of the centre and I don't see how, you know, White, I don't see how White's easily going to reorganise her minor piece. For example, you know, you might want to put the knight on E2 in some scenarios, but that leaves the bishop trapped at the moment. Oh, yes, you I'm sort of that. looking at yeah. moves that could improve the minor pieces without allowing, you know, obvious unpleasantness. <laughs> Mm. in response oh wait a sec actually that may have been oh no that is true i just noticed that after c4 you could try knight d4 hitting the bishop but then there's bishop c5 so oh yes yeah yeah and yes. then there's bishop e2 oh no there's sorry there's a bishop one d oh, no, no that's all that's all bad news for white so yeah, yeah. so white needs to be a little careful with her reorganization so after c5 it feels to me like black's got a fair share of the center but i mean it should be said that kata uh, yeah b3 looks like a very prudent move should we say Kata um, was getting results against 2,400 plus players? You know, she had two of them mm. in the British Women's Championship, didn't she? She, yes. I think she beat, didn't she beat um, 
Harriet. You're testing my memory, yes. So. Harriet Ann Ketty, I think. You know, she's Did very, she? very capable on a good day of, of results against very strong players. And That's right. She did it in consecutive did, rounds. Yeah. We, just, we need her to find a little bit of that form again because mm. she is a, a very strong player on her day and none of the team has quite got into, got into rhythm yet, I think, but let's see what we can see today. Okay, so this position all still to play for, but I do feel it's reasonably comfortable for Black now. At least I would feel comfortable, I think, if I had Black pieces there. Okay, let's see. Uh, Louise. Okay, I'm going to flip. Oh, this looks... Oh, let's, flip, let's flip the board. Let's flip the board. There we go. Here's Louise. Okay, this arose from very interesting variation of the, I think, the Panov attack, where Black meet in the Karakhan, where Black meets Bishop G5 with a very early Bishop E6. And this was... And sorry, this Bishop E6 happened even before Bishop G5. This was a very, very early Bishop E6. And what happened was that White gave... Um, her dark square bishop up with the intention of kind of gaining space, time, and development. But of course, when you pl and it happened in conjunction with pawn advances like d5, if you move your central pawns onto white squares at the same moment you're giving up your dark square bishop, you kind of really have to prove something about you know that they're really well placed, otherwise, that can come back to bite you. So, you know, when I first saw this, I thought, hmm, white's giving up a lot of dark squares here. And if Black can navigate the next few moves, she may be doing quite well. And I have to say, as far as I can see, Louise has navigated the next few moves quite mm. well. And I must say, I rather like her position at this point. You know, her yeah. king, okay, she she had to play king f8 in reply to a queen e2 check. But as long as the king's... It's going to sit nicely on g7, isn't it? Popping neatly onto g7. You know, and if white has some attacking ideas with g4, it may be very convenient to have your rook already on h8 for that. You know, it may actually be quite well placed for that. So I like Black's bishop pair, I like the dark squares, and I like the fact that d5 has given, you know, a further chunk of d dark squares to Black. Yeah. And I feel quite like Louise has, has started very well in this game. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. And let's see. Uh, let's see Maria's game. Oh, another, uh, looks like another advanced Karakhan, this one. Um, and it's an interesting system by White, because she played a very quick h4, but in conjunction with knight f3. I'm more used to very quick h4s being either in conjunction with playing pawn to c4 or with knight to c3. It's a strange one, or maybe more with pawn to c4, but playing knight f3 so early and then h four is I think quite unusual. Um so what I think she's trying to do is show that well I mean she's obviously once you've played h4 h5 there are issues of where each side is going to put their king and I guess that she was trying to show that the h5 pawn was going to be a little bit awkward for black but with the bishop sort of placed quite comfortably on g4 i'm not sure how easy it's going to be to show that that's the case i think black is hardly ever going to be grabbing white's h pawn with bishop takes f3 and bishop takes h4 because then her own h pawn would be in trouble but i'm not quite sure how white is going to try and dislodge that bishop mm. and thereby show that there's any problems for black's h4 and meanwhile it's not too clear to me how the queen side is going to pan out either but it feels like because, you know, you, you can imagine either side wanting to have a pawn break with c4 or c5, respectively. But the fact that a4, a5 has been flicked in means that whenever you play one of those, it comes with weakening a, a square quite drastically at the same time. So I think there's a lot of, uh, lot of judgment calls to be made by both sides in this position. And it would be interesting to see yeah. what Maria does next. I don't know whether knight e3 might be on her mind. Um. I don't know if there are any scenarios. Sometimes, you know, occasionally in these lines, you find that um, it looks a little implausible, but you find that taking the knight on h6 makes some sense if it would otherwise be coming to f5. I think there's a oh, lot. I, I hadn't thought of that. Like, yeah. Sorry, what was that? I hadn't thought of that. Taking there's on a lot. I think there's a lot to think about here. Yeah, I don't think that's top of the agenda, but I can certainly think of some lines where that plays a role. Just because, you know, amongst other things, if there's a lot going on, the rook on h6 can look a bit silly for a few moves. Mm. But 
I'm not sure there's enough going on to justify that. My my feeling is black's probably comfortable enough, but again, it's uh, very complex. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a similar position to a lot of known theory, but it feels a little bit, uh, you know, it's not quite the same as anything I can put my finger on and say, you know, yep. it's exactly like that. So there's a lot for them to lot to work out. All right. And let's see, Shira. And a lot for us to work out as well. A lot for us to work <laughs> Oh, now this one. Oh, dear. This one looks a bit scary. Okay. Um, yeah, this does look quite scary because... What was this? French defence. Ah, okay. Why don't we start our deeper analysis here and just to take Why a, not? Because it's, yeah, it's, 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 it's just yeah, the last of the eight games. Let's, let's take this opening more slowly because I also know a little bit about this one. Okay, so the French Tower Ash in 3C5, which has been one of the most respectable moves for the whole of my lifetime, I think. I'm going to flip the board, given we're doing it. Okay, so C5. And now, well, the reason White tends to play Knight GF3 here is if they're not so keen on queen takes d5 variations, or at least that's one of the main reasons, because it's quite difficult now for black to find a move after which queen takes d5 will be a sense. Because, you know, once the knight's on f3, as soon as black plays queen takes d5, white can hit the queen with bishop c4. Yeah. Whereas if the knight's still on g1, that leaves the g pawn on prees with sad consequences. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's difficult for black to play. There is one, uh, I think, after... Knight f6, there are still some queen takes d5 variations, but okay, black has played c takes d4, which is one of several ways of sorry, it's it, this is actually sorry, this is the move with the queen takes d5. But after knight takes, black's played knight c6, where knight f6, pawn takes, pawn queen takes is still a quite common variation, but knight c6 is also very interesting. And white pins the knight, and black unpins, yeah, and now. It, well, it doesn't make sense for white to give the bishop pair at that at this point. Playing knight takes c6 makes a lot more sense. Thanks. And it, however, however, black recaptures, white has the possibility, if she wants it, to attack this black pawn center with c4 at some point. So if the bishop takes on c6 instead, so I just mentioned that quickly, then exchanging on c6 and playing c4 is definitely the way to try and challenge black setup and often followed by a quick queen a4 that kind of thing yeah although i must say for all of this i think this is a, a pretty solid and decent line for black as well but she's chosen b takes c6 which is i'm not quite sure i, I you know I, i've seen occasions where black gets nice play against this as well but i think it's a little bit riskier so white goes bishop d3 and now it's it's Shira's next move that I really don't like that much. I kind of feel like e5 is asking a lot of black center when she's relatively undeveloped. You know, mm -hmm. it's going to be easy for white to attack it with c4, and I think it's going to be relatively difficult to hold it in a comfortable way, which I think is what's going to happen shortly. And also I don't see a need for e5 because I actually quite like the queen and bishop on the black diagonal from d6 down to h2. So sort of playing bishop d6, queen c7, knight e7. Now, I don't, I can't remember offhand the details of all that. But as a general setup, if black can do that, then I think it's reasonably solid because the knight also comes to g6 and is a very decent piece there. So sort of knight e7 to g6 yeah. and maybe queen c7. That, that feels like the right setup in principle. Now, there may be some details about why that's difficult to get in. But that's what you want, I think. And e5, given that white, as I said, is going to attack this center with c4 anyway, e5 is sort of putting a, you know, it's it's yeah. going to soak up quite a bit of pressure or it's going to get fixed. And I think it really doesn't want to get fixed. So white castled, which is a reasonable, I mean, she could play c4, but there's no reason not to castle. Bishop yeah. e6. Sure. So it looks like she's sort of heading for a slightly similar setup to the one we wanted. But I don't know even if that's the right setup anymore. I might have been tempted to go knight f6 there, having gone e5. Yeah, because once the pawn's on e5, it's not... Yeah, you know, it's not so clear. What, I mean, you don't have bishop and queen lining up in the same way anymore. So white played c4, and now black pushed. And I think, you know, you can see why, because 
the, the pressure on the centre is going to be quite considerable and quite quick. It might be that after 97 or something, White could already look at taking twice and there might be some issues for the black pieces. I mean, if you just check 97, pawn takes, takes, and other pawn takes. And if black took on e5, I could, d5, sorry, I could see her being vulnerable to some mix of bishop e4 pinning the knight against the rook or some knight c4 where all the pieces are lined up. You know, there's a lot of scary tactical things to navigate very early on here. Yeah, so if you'd like to defend like that. Knight c4. Maybe knight c4. And, you know, I can't immediately see why bishop c7 followed by, uh, is catastrophic, but I can well believe it is. Queen f3 and rook d1 might already be disastrous. I don't know. Something like that. You know, what you can see what I mean. There's a real... Yeah. Yeah, Real, yeah. Um, pressure looks a bit, yeah. yeah, Black's got a lot of loose pieces, you know, the sort of things you yeah. you learn about in tactical exercises. So, yeah, usually, or, or by unpleasant experience. So, yeah, I lost so, a lot. you can kind of see why she pushed, but at the same time, that's a definitely a concession, I think. Yeah, yeah, so, but it's probably, yes, it must be the safest thing. So, the center doesn't yes. all open up. Well, yes, but I think, as you see from White's next move, she has some fairly aggressive Ooh, intentions yes. for opening the position up anyway. So, um, I mean, you know, this is clearly a pawn sack, at least temporarily, but that knight... Yeah, can we take this thing? Well, it sure we does. See, four squares opened up for the knight, and White really is... White's eyeing up an f4 pawn break without that bishop being there to defend it or to exchange dark square bishops and so on. And, yeah, I sort of... I don't find it that surprising that this compensation is fairly scary yeah now white did think for 10 minutes about this move so i think it's not well in that case i'm kind of more impressed if she whipped it out as part of theory then okay yeah Fair enough you can respect her uh, sort of preparation and diligence but i got a feeling that she, if she found this at the board it's a very nice idea to find mm. i mean it may well be that it is there in some other variations and she's just checking that it applies in this case but black's development suggests to me that it, it quite likely does still it's important so you have to you have to be careful and make sure as white that there really is, you know, that you're not. So white here, yeah, she's um, born 2001, 20-year-old. Sorry, born 2001. 2001, yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I think this is, uh, I mean, there's even younger members than that of the team as well, mm. but yeah. Okay. So. I'm sure he does take. Yes. So now knight c4. It's a beautiful square, but again, as I said, yeah, as we said, it's not enough to give a pawn for a nice square. You need to show some initiative as well. So black needs to defend that, and queen e7 looks as rational as any other. Yeah. And now this f4, which f4, does look quite dangerous. Breaking it all open. Yeah. And. Okay. So, this... so, so could black just simply recap just take on f4 well that's the other move i'd want to look at other than you know the kind of thing she played mm. i don't think f6 is much fun because it opens up queen h5 check possibilities as well yeah, that, it's not even doesn't look nice at all to me no but taking on f4 you obviously could consider and bishop takes i assume yeah and now i think there's plenty of things around to make black nervous so you know, in a sense, you want to go um, knight f6 and castle, but, you know, it, it might be hit by e5, it might be hit by yeah. bishop g5, right. you know, there's various, various things you need to worry about there. Hi, Jonathan. Ah, is that... That's Jonathan Blackburn. It is. Oh, that's excellent. He's done with his gardening. He's done your garden. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay. His garden's become quite quite well known this morning. It's, like, mm. it's become a thing. Yeah. Um. So what's the what's White's best? I'm kind of wondering what was White's what was so deadly about that that, that right here. Um, the engine's very keen on White. Um, yeah. And I mean, I was thinking thing, about this one. Perhaps. You can see why it looks scary. Yeah. I just wondered then if you can go h6 and just grin and bear it. I mean, it's not very nice, but yeah. I mean, e5 is the main threat now. Yeah. So. I think we need to address that. Yeah. And then what just takes? Well, if you go bishop h4, I probably have to try h5, whether I like it, or uh, g5, I mean, whether I like it or not. So. 
Yeah, bishop h4, and then g5, well, at least now I, I can sort of eye up some of white's slightly vulnerable squares as well. So something like knight g4 here, and then it feels to me like black has probably had a bit of a relatively an escape. Yeah. Because, you know, there's an e3 square to consider as well, and... I mean, in this position, you're threatening bishop e5, so I probably have to go into something like knight g4, but I'm not that reluctant to. And, you know, this, this, does, this doesn't look as terrible as I thought it might be. If you take on f6, I don't know, it seems a shame to give that bishop when, when that was part of the... On the other hand, black's pawn weaknesses are fairly serious after that. So, yeah, I, I mean, true. even if it isn't amazingly great for white, you can well see what... And so, taking yeah, you can well see why black would be rather mm. afraid of this and then... I don't know. There's, I mean, White's doing quite well if she plays Queen F3 and takes on F6 and plays with her. But I think the temptation for White is definitely to play with Queens and try and get some kind of E5 break. So, I mean, if you play Queen H5 or something, the first question is where on earth are you going to put... Have I blundered? I haven't blundered. Where on earth are you going to put Black King, I suppose? Yeah. Like Ideas like E5 with Rook A1, it just looks very scary for Black, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, it may or may not be disastrous, but it looks very scary. So I can totally understand why she didn't like the look of this. Mm. This is an illustration of why d4 is just... I mean, positionally, it felt a bit suspect, but it's starting to look like dynamically and tactically. It's even more... more. It gives White an awful lot of ideas. All righty. So, uh, so what she did was play... d6. d6, yeah. Okay, but this also looks pretty horrible. I mean, takes takes queen h five looks very uh, very plausible, doesn't it? Yeah. So this one, this takes. Yeah, what she played looks very sensible to me because black can't support the bishop with f six legally, so it has to retreat. So I, I fear that white is getting the kind of compensation she had in the last line without being a pawn down, basically. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's looking a bit tricky. Let's see. So bishop c7. And now bishop g5, but I I, I think white could also have looked at... Uh, I, I don't think it makes that much difference, because bishop g5, then if knight f6, I assume queen h4 is very awkward. So, yeah, so if this and that... So queen h4 looks very nasty, threatening primarily rook takes f6, I would have thought. Yeah, yeah. You don't want to give up your mere bishop when you, <laughs> your bishop when you could give up your rooks. It's such a monstrous bishop. All right. So, she not, to... so queen e six, but I can't. Yeah, yeah, I can't even see. I wonder what move the engine preferred because e six maybe is that possible? G six. No. <laughs> Pretty ugly, isn't it? Isn't it sort of definitely not. Definitely wasn't plan A. Yeah, I mean, amongst other things, White could take on e7 and play bishop c5 with d4 dropping and probably the rook as well. But there may be, I mean, you know, queen h4 may be even lost. This is really unpleasant, poor, poor thing. And queen e6. Yep. And then e5. You can see how fiercely this white attack develops. And basically, there's a plan of, in some order, rook, rook a e1 and knight d6 check. And that could very easily be game over if she doesn't find. Mm. A very accurate defence here. Okay. okay, let's move. Let's um, let's not. Thank you for sure. Let's dwell see. on these horrors. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, shall we? Shall we pop across actually back to the open? Yes. Let's do that for a bit. Let's do that. Um, okay. All right, where do you want to start? Start with Mickey? You, are we going in reverse? Yeah, let's go in reverse. So we'll reverse, we'll start in reverse. Okay, let's start with Ravi. Okay. So let's see how it all happened. Yeah. So, so yeah, I mean, this move order by White allows Black lots of other setups, like not playing e6 and playing c6, bishop g4. But if if I just is, noticed Green's comments for um, Sherry's maybe knight f6 and castles long, although obviously it's a bit horrible. Yeah, no, that's probably a um, 
I imagine that's better than anything else. But as he says, a bit horrible. Um, yeah, so this, I mean, I think this is a very nice move order for getting into the Catalan with white if if you're not worried about those other systems for black. Because if black just plays with D e6 and d5, you get into some of these sort of safe, small advantage Catalan lines without allowing a lot of the uh, sort of more hairy, sharp stuff. Of course, if you want the very sharp stuff, then this isn't the way to go. But if you want to get the positional grind, I mean, mm. Catalan's fascinating because people always sort of think of the Catalan as being very solid and played by people who want a kind of small advantage with no risk. But there are so many crazy sacrificial lines as well that it's sort of kind of you kind of have to be willing to play all kinds of positions to play to play the sharp Catalans. I mean, you can yeah. sort of bail out of some like Wolf Anderson or something used to do, but most people actually end up playing a real range of sharp positions and and the ones like Ravi gets here where you're trying to nurture. Yeah. A, so was yeah. Ravi kind of chose this? What particular move? Well, no, I think black. I, well, okay. So the point at which Ravi is making a significant choice here is a four on move eight. So up to queen c2, a6, this is all very standard mainline open Catalan. And white has a fundamental choice whether to play queen takes c4 and allow b5, or whether to play a4 and prevent it. Yeah. And, you know, if you're playing queen takes c4 and allowing b5, you're making some kind of claim that b5 is in, in a way a weakness. You know, it is something to aim at, and it weakens the c5 square and... You know, a lot what white plays a lot of systems where the main effort is to try to prevent black playing c5 or hold it back for a long time, that kind of thing. But you know, in this system, if black plays as as he did here, he's as I said, in a way, he's creating fewer weaknesses, but he's also gaining less space and possibilities for counterplay as well. So a4, I mean, it's a very interesting. A4 is both moves are interesting. Both moves. You can make a case for either. And after bishop d7, white has sharp options as well. White can play rook d1. White can play knight e5. Queen c4 kind of acquiesces in black getting his bishop c6 thing in. Yeah. Um, and okay, so queen bishop c6. About the only trick in the position is that white shouldn't play knight c3 here. Oh, right. That's worth that. showing that because it's sort of not that obvious. Then black plays b5. The point being oh, okay. that Pawn takes loses a rook because the queen can't come back and defend that one. That's quite neat. Is, and of course, you don't play Pawn takes Pawn, but actually you don't want to play Knight C3 if it's just going to get driven back with C, B4 because then black gains space and time quite quickly. Yeah. So that's the only one trick. So white tends to white tends to be interested in playing E4 here ultimately because if you can play E4 without Bishop on C6, it's a little bit awkward. So white plays Bishop G5. And there are lines where they play, you know, they will later play rook e1 or knight c3 and e4 once it doesn't lose, once knight c3 isn't a mistake. And, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of different systems here. But um, black went for this very direct system, which I think is probably one of the most solid, trying to give, you know, we're trying to um, get white to give the g5 bishop for the knight, which they're usually relatively happy to do to try and play e4. And then instead of allowing e4, you take on f3, so then you get an opposite color bishop position. Yeah. And black getting rid of this bishop enables black to play c6. And then it's super solid. Black's no longer aiming for the c5 pawn break because that just will open up white's remaining bishop. So these moves have all been seen many times and h6 as well. Yeah. And so Ravi does go ahead and yeah. take that. So he knight. takes and now knight c3. And now if black didn't take on f3, white would gain a very nice center with e4. And that would be good compensation for the bishops. So black takes and sets up this solid thing with C6. C6. Yeah. Yeah, so it's quite a, it feels like quite a quiet game now. It is quite a quiet game. I'm trying to make it sound exciting, but yes, it's quite quiet. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's it's one of black's super solid lines in the Catalan. And I mean, you, you know, if you're deciding whether the Catalan is for you as a, as a system you have to have some confidence that in positions like this you're going to be able to make something of it because otherwise it yes it's going to be a bit turgid but okay white has a couple of ideas one is as he does to play queen b3 another important thing is for white to manage to get to play a5 before black does i think okay if so that can play a5 that now, then? That square. Right. not now i think no. deep horns on pre's at the moment oh, yeah. queen b3 is needed we need a few tactical things going for us to yeah. enable that Okay, so queen c7. Yeah, it's interesting that 
the engine seems more pessimistic after Queen C7. I'm not sure why. I can't really think of why that would not be the most sensible move. Hmm. To be quite honest. Okay, that's very strange. And rook fd1. Okay. Now the interest. The question here is why black can't play a5 at this moment before white does. Okay. So, as I said, if, if black can play a5 without anything bad happening, then in the same way that they do in the Slav, they want to gain control of that b4 square. And, you know, also white's a5 will in turn clamp black's b6 square a little bit. So, you know, they're just contesting squares on the queen side, as tends to happen when you're not, when you've not got enormous amounts of sharpness going on elsewhere. And, okay, I, 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 there is some reason, I think, maybe white has a quick, I think the reason is probably rook c1 is awkward for the queen. Because then black doesn't have knight d7, because then white can play d5 yeah. as a break. Use the fact that that queen is on the C file, and after knight d7, white can play d5. If I remember, well, and it sort of makes sense as well that something like that will be the reason. Yeah. Why? Well, you know, if black could play a5 without any comeback, then he would do it. I think. Yeah. So, yeah. So black. You know, this is a sign that although the position is quite closed up. There are occasions where white can make a leading development count, and that means that black probably is wise to play a developing move rather than. So rook d8. The so Gwen saying, can Ravi manage a quick rook a c1 and d5 here? And I think that's probably just um, in the position we just showed. Yeah, so. no, I think that's right, and I got there. <laughs> just, got there. <laughs> just in time. <laughs> yeah, but that, that's yeah. absolutely what he does, I think, yes. Yeah. So rook d8. Ninety-four, and this is where we and this is where we saw the game when we were doing our quick snapshot, isn't it? Yeah. And we decided Black can't take on d4 because of simply e3, and the Queen can't then defend both d8 and b7. Yes, we had an overloaded Queen. Well, if if the if Black tried to play Bishop b6, well, then suspicious. I think White would go a5, and we'd mm -hmm. see that. It, uh, so mm -hmm. if Bishop b6, Rook d8, uh, Rook takes d8 and a5. You see, the Queen is even more overloaded because then she's defending a Rook and a Bishop. And this is a really, uh, you know, this is serious overload. Yeah. Bishop takes yeah. a five, queen b seven, and black's just in a terrible mess. In fact, the fact that it, the fact that she's hitting the rook may not even be the only point. There's a, knight d seven would presumably be met by rook d one as well. So, yeah, black is just way yeah. short of time to do anything here. Yeah, this this would be Ravi's dream, but it's not going to. Yeah, happen. this is a dream which will have to be for another day, I think. <laughs> Black was wise to this one. So bishop e7. And now I think this is the sort of position. Now that the knight's gone to e4, there's no d5 danger anymore. If black could simply play a5, I think that would be an unambiguous gain for black, which is why Ravi now does it in this way. Yeah, so Ravi plays a5 now. Yeah. Knight d7. And... Uh, so Ravi's rerouting. Is he going? He's going. Going for. I think. It, well, he's created this b6 square, and I assume he's en route there, or you know, to to at least perhaps tie Black's knight down to defending it more than actually going there. But I think the knight is quite well placed on c4. It also the knight being on c4 presumably also frees up that rook on a1, which might otherwise have to defend the a pawn. Yes. You know, it's nice to have a5 in there, but you've also always when you play those kind of moves, you've got to make sure that you have sufficient pieces to go and support those advanced pawns as well so does white still want to e4 mm, that's a very good question i think sometime i think i don't think there's a definite yes or no to that i can imagine scenario well i think you might want an e4 if you thought that you could blast open the position with d5 advantageously but of course when you do go d5 you're you're giving up a square on c5, and so long as your queen's on b3, you know, something like knight c5 hitting your queen might be annoying. Or it might, but I think e4, I mean, white needs to find a plan. That's the sort of at the end of the day, that's the key thing here is finding a plan. And e4 and d5 is a possible plan. The other thing which could happen after e4 and d5 is that black might simply try, as long as it doesn't lose a piece to d6, black mm. might simply try to meet d5 with e5. And then you can reach a scenario where, you know, any kind of clarification of the centre leads to an awful lot of dark squares for black. And actually the bishop on e7 could easily become better than the bishop on f3. So I think possibly, but it needs to be done with some care. 
Yeah. And again, you know, if you if you found some position where white's attacking on the king side, but even e4, e5 could conceivably be a plan. But it's very, very risky compared with doing none of the above. You know, if you maneuver around this nice formation you have, black. I think we can read. Yeah, reason. black doesn't have so much to do, really. Does well, black it? doesn't have any decent pawn breaks. If black plays c5, you're always going to meet it with d5. And actually, if he plays d5, uh, e5, you're going to meet it with d5 most of the time as well. And those things will probably enhance white's light squared bishop more than they do black's dark squared bishop. So white can sit there and improve the position for a while. Mm. And if you improve the position enough, yes, then e4 might become part of the plan. You can also, first, you might gain space on the king side, h4, king, g2. You know, Ooh, that's true. That's true. This that's is true. very manoeuvring stuff. You know, the more, yeah. if your opponent can't do anything, then you have a lot of time to try and set up your optimal position before you actually take action. But none of, none of it's easy. It's all, um, yeah. you know, finding a, a really convincing plan for white is probably the main challenge. If you're trying. Oh, a nice comment from Gawain. Ravi's got the perfect position for team chess. Yes. So I suppose you can maneuver around, see what everyone else does, and then decide whether you have to go all out or, or whether you just keep That's maneuvering. That's absolutely true. And this kind of position, I mean, you know, I can say as, a, as somebody who's been team captain a lot, when one of your players has this kind of position, it is, for that reason, always quite reassuring. Just you know, you there are, there are very few chances of losing unless you start playing very hard to win. And mm. that is quite a nice position to be in for team chess. You know, the worst thing in team chess is when your players with the white pieces sort of agree early draws or something. Or, and um, the other scary thing is when they go all out crazily. This one is... Or they play nice the Mora Gambit like what I do. Well, yeah, an absolutely delightful <laughs> being thing. your captain. That would be... <laughs> so something like, yeah, this where you've got some pressure, but relatively low chances of losing unless you go all in. It, yeah, it's a bit of a team captain's dream, I should think. Yes. Okay. So rook b8 and then knight round to c4. And and black's also playing quite slow, so uh, g6. Yeah, I mean, black's, as we said, black doesn't really have... I mean, if we're worried about white not having an obvious plan, we should be even more worried about black, probably. Mm. And here is at least one of the moves I mentioned as a sort of vague preparatory improving move king g2 yeah. is coming up in a moment eight, so yeah so the knight on c4 as i said has enabled the rook on a1 to move and you know there are no pawn breaks for black that make any sense mm. you can see how the bishop on g7 might be mildly preferable to the bishop on e7 so g6 makes sense and you know white if white plays h4 i suspect it's quite likely black may feel the need to respond with h5, although I'm not sure about that. I'm not entirely sure that there might not be scenarios where black would be happy with h5, g5 happening or something. It's very yeah. difficult to see exactly what Ravi's <laughs> going to make of this. I suppose black yeah. needs to be... Yeah, let's see. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of different ways white can try and play this, but it's not. there's no plan that leaps out at you as obviously very strong. Still, as we said, a very nice position for a team situation. Nice for the nice for the teammates to see somebody with a little bit of pressure and very little risk. Yeah. Okay. Let's. So we're working upwards. We're working the, up the team. <laughs> yeah. Uh, right, where are we? And then when we've Freddie, done that, maybe we should okay. flick and see how uh, Freddie and Trisha. We see Scotland as well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, right. So let's flip this board. And let's see, David. Okay. So this was the Karakan. <clears throat> so, yeah, as I said, this is one of the many advanced Karakan lines of the kind of positional type, the ones all kind of based around the short system, where white, white tries to make it difficult for black to get the move C5 in. I mean, what I think... Black can't, for example, now black can't play it already without giving the bishop pair because if they played c5 and took back with the knight, there's going to be a horrible bishop b5 check or something. Okay, <laughs> the king's yeah. going to go walk about. So black does need some preparation to try and get. So h6 is quite a common move in these lines. Before you put something on e7, you sometimes just want to ensure that knight h4 won't win the bishop pair. Mm -hmm. Some positions where that doesn't matter, but somewhere it does. Well, Sonia, uh, was it wanting some reti openings from the Slovaks? Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes. Well, the old the Slovak team of old, Igor Stoll, 
Lubomir Tachnik, people like that, I think you would have been, you would have had good chance no. with some vetting. No. But... <laughs> These youngsters. Not the modern Slovaks. These youngsters, no, exactly. So this is the moment where. So I'm. I. I mean, I don't know this position. I if I if I do, I can't remember it. I'm wondering what Black's idea is if White goes a four because it seems to me that securing, since that yeah. White is doing a decent job of trying to stop c five. We're going to find out what White's idea is because they no. did play a four. No, we're not. We're a four by oh. White. I mean, to stop a four. So I wanted to stop um, Black's A4 with A4 by yeah, White. Yeah. The point being now that, you know, we've got the situation where if Black plays C5, at least then White gets a, a pawn, uh, sorry, a square on B5. And White's just trying to secure that knight on B3. And, and you know, having started with a strategy of trying to make C5 difficult to get in, it seems to me logical to at least look at continuing to try and make it difficult to get in. Yeah. You know, once Black plays A4... And knight c1, it's very easy to get c5 in. So I'm not quite sure what the sort of coherence of white's strategy is at that point. <laughs> I mean, if I was playing white here without, you know, any particular preparation, a4 would be completely the natural move to me. Yeah. Yeah, it looks sensible, doesn't it? It does. It seems because because a, once black plays a4, you've got to move that knight again. Yeah, I'm not quite it's sure what... David's intention would have been in this case, but I, that's the move I would have played with White, just because I think after Bishop D2, A4, I don't... I mean, I've seen, you know, there are some lines where White plays Bishop D2 in these systems when they're securing an A5 square for the knight or something, but he's certainly not doing that here. So where is where is the... Um, what's, what's the purpose of, other than giving the knight a C1 square? I don't see the kind of how yeah. White's moves really fit together. Yeah. So I'm, you know, from David's point of view, I think life is a lot easier now. He's been allowed yeah, to play yeah, A4 yeah. and C5. Yeah, that'd be nice. I mean, if Gawain has an idea what Black's idea is after A4, I'd be interested. But uh, or indeed, if anyone else does, but uh, Gawain <laughs> may have some insight into this thing. On the other hand, he may have more insight than he's allowed to speak about. So. Yeah, yeah, he's not going to give anything away. Well, exactly. Yeah. Um. Okay. C5 now. So now Black does get this move in. Well, exactly. And, you know, on the face of it, unless there's a, some idea that I haven't seen, like, like White's position. Gawain <laughs> has no insight. Gawain has no insight. That's not generally true, but <laughs> it's true in this On this particular On this particular position, we should emphasise. Okay. That's what Gawain said. That wasn't my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> no, exactly. Yeah. Well, you would say that, wouldn't you? <laughs> um, okay, Bishop B5. Bishop e5 looks a, is, is a slightly strange move. It looks a little bit artificial on the face of it. And again, so the, I, well, I, I'm baffled slightly by White's idea here. It seems from the next couple of moves that White's doing what people often do in the advanced caro when Black does get c5 in. They're trying to play a quick c4 and create a position in which it's all about speedy development and opening the position opening up suddenly. But White's pieces don't look to me well placed for that scenario. Mm. I was just having a look at the move time. So White did spend um, quite a long time on bishop d2. Yes. The a5 he was weighing up whether he wanted to play a4 or not. But I'd be, mm. I'd be fascinated to be able to read his mind at that point. But Yeah. Okay. Can't provide that facility. So... No. Knight c6. Be a bit sinister if we could, really. Yeah. <laughs> um, so c4. I mean, I'm trying a little bit to get a handle on why White wants the bishop on b5 when playing c4. I guess it's because it prevents c takes d4, which would be met by bishop takes c6 and knight takes d4. That's one. That's one obvious reason to have it there. So if the bishop were still on e2, white would have to reckon with... Well, in this position, c takes d4 wouldn't be the right move anyway. So, okay, d takes c4 makes a lot of sense. Yeah. But, you know, every one of white's moves here, bishop c3 as well, it suggests to me that white is really just coping with the fact that his pieces aren't very well placed. But the knight on c1 doesn't look Yeah, that I mean, what's how does that fit with the strategy of opening up the position with a quick c4? You know, if... As what happens in the game, 
black is able to defend the c4 and a4 pawns and then really ask why what on earth is the idea here i must say i like this very much for black but yeah it takes bishop c3 again you know that that move is defending d4 rather than enabling white to do anything very active or scary i think and look look david's hanging on to the pawn he's got knight b6 yeah the thing is the move which i mean if white if white could play d5 in that position after bishop c3 then maybe that bishop would make a bit more sense you know he starts to open up that diagonal seems to me that black here hanging on to the pawn sort of is is done by the move black would like to play anyway which is to prevent d5 and you know controls control some squares before getting on with his development it seems to me it ticks all the boxes in other words yeah. and just looks very pleasant for very pleasant for black yeah so oh because so what if if white tries to take the pawn now what in order to try to go knight d4 maybe yeah uh, oh no i was thinking sorry tries to uh recapture the c4 pawn some way you, ah. you, you kind of tangle up a bit though because it's you'd either do it with like knight d2 or queen e2 um well you certainly haven't got knight d2 because you need that to defend d4 yeah, so um, you couldn't really do it. Yeah. Yeah. So now what's going to an, a pawn and a nice outpost on d5. And well, I mean, both knight, knight, b, knight b6 does everything you want it to. It, it takes yeah. the square you're aiming at as well as defending the pawn. So yeah, 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 yeah. nothing not to like. I mean, if, if d takes c5, I think black could have changed queens. Knight e2, is that knight what he's played? That makes slightly That's what he played, yeah. Okay, so I suppose here his idea might be that if black plays bishop e7, then white can take on c5 at a moment when he's subsequently going to get knight e4 in or something. Oh, sorry, knight d4 in. But the... there is nothing about this to get white excited, I don't think. I think what, what I'm no, trying no. to do for white there is damage limitation. For it's sure. extra pawn, isn't it? Yeah, and knight d4 can come when the knight's pinned and, um, yeah. you know, hit the bishop and c6. So say you did that one. Yeah, I'm not sure which one. Maybe the other one. One or the other. One. <laughs> one of them. <laughs> one of them. That one feels more it's natural. Right, I'm not even it. sure I know why. Well, bishop d3, the knight takes c6 is a complication I think black would want uh, to avoid just because he doesn't need to get involved. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm not sure here. I mean, bishop e4 is one move, but then white's, you know, black's advantage doesn't look quite so terrifying them but it's 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 a clear advantage because we white still has to try and gather up this extra pawn and we still have an awful lot of nice squares yeah. and you know the some of the right trades of minor pieces are going to happen for the squares we have anyway so just looks like the whole opening has gone very badly wrong for white <laughs> okay so looking and, very yeah looking very David. promising for david i mean you couldn't ask okay. for much more out of an out of a caracan after 14 moves i mean yeah. Okay. I don't remember getting this sort of advantage with it too often. <laughs> All righty. Let's have a look then at uh, board two. So this is Luke. And I'm going to... This has moved on very little from where we were before. Okay. They've had a 14 minute, uh, a 15 minute think, and then a couple of 12, 13 minute thinks, which... Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, so, good, I suppose the good news in that is that the long thinks are not all Luke's. But yeah, 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 yeah. Both players thinking. Both players thinking a long time, yeah. Okay, Sicilian we've got. And knight f3. d4. Because Luke sometimes does some... Um, Luke has been known to do kind of 3g3 against e6 as well. And... Um, the, the line we saw in a game the other day, actually, was, as I said, he... He'd had that against Nakamura, that kind of thing. But here, I think C4 is also yeah. now in his repertoire. Sort of what Maroxi binds. Well, yeah, I mean, it's what well, you sort of either get a choice of a Maroxi bind or some position where Black does as he did here and tries to use that extra time that he gets from C4 to play Knight F6 and Bishop B4 and and try and attack the e port. Yeah. And yeah. then the key question yeah. is whether white's going to... So sometimes white allows some structural damage and gets some dark squares and some attacking chances in return. 
In this case, as we said, Luke's trying to avoid the structural damage as well by defending C3 with his queen. Although, yeah. obviously, we need to check. You could still take it, though, couldn't you? Yeah, we need to check first what happens if black plays bishop takes C3. Yeah, so if takes. Yeah. Okay, the honest answer here is that I'm sure I know this, but I can't remember. Mm. So everything I say from now will be just <laughs> trying to bluff, basically. Um, Presumably queen takes. Well, Do queen well, I don't know. I mean, presumably if you, there's either a good good move for white after knight takes e4 and it's absolutely fine or there's not and i can't honestly mm. recall what it is i mean b takes wouldn't be ridiculous because as i said yeah. you can sometimes don't no, i wasn't suggesting this so you play but you can look you know that structural damage isn't that pretty but in this case we have sort of bishop a3s sometimes yeah you know, black's done mm. black's played a lot of pawn moves that are the moves of someone who'd really like to have a dark square bishop you know a6 e6 yeah. You know, yeah. it isn't a particularly pretty pawn structure not to have a dark square bishop with. And the queen on d3 may have some prospects of going to g3 or something, and so maybe. But I, I suspect that, that there would be other ways for white to get that sort of position than queen d3 if taking with the queen, uh, if taking with the pawn were the idea. So I'm trying to recall. But after queen takes, knight takes e4, I can't remember, in all honesty, whether there's a good move. It's not that obvious to me that there is. But on the other hand, you know, there's some things to... Yeah. Well, maybe not. Okay. Okay. No, it's a, it's a good question. I can't honestly remember. Probably white does take with the pawn, but then, you know, a case needs to be made for why queen d3 is the development move that you want in that situation. Okay, so d6. After d6, knight c2, it's clear that white's able to take with the queen without having to sacrifice a pawn. Um, yeah, because then you've got, uh, you can take on g7. Yeah. yeah, that's right. I don't know whether bishop c5 is a move here, but it doesn't make sense. No, it might it might not be ridiculous, but it doesn't look like it fits terribly well with black setup. So okay, black went in and yeah. so said black okay. So I have was, yeah. Now that the knights attacking the bishops. Yeah. So he has some development in return for the, but not very much. I mean, if you think about the queen c two nimzo, white's played queen c two and plays a three before having to take back on c three. Here, white's only sort of done queen d three to c three, which isn't a huge loss of tempo. Yeah. Bishop d3, d5. Okay. I mean, d5 is a very logical move in that if black does have this, if what black has in return for the queen is a leading development, sorry, for the for the queen. Sorry, for the, yeah. for the, uh, Ooh, okay, yeah. Gawain's confirmed that we are, it is right that you take on um, c3 with the b pawn and then the black dark squares are too weak in that position as you're saying yeah i mean they do look fairly ugly although you know there are i i wondered whether there's other ways in which white can sort of try to make black take on c3 but i guess those all take some time yes yeah, so yeah it makes sense to be taking with the pawn but now we've got this interesting thing yeah it's one of those situations I, i'm going to mention john watson now because he's he's my favorite on go all on people. mention john watson i've got to mention john watson he's the one who said that um Contrary to what theory kind of implies, there are loads and loads of positions where the player with the knight pair is the one who opens the position. Yeah. Because very often when you have the knight pair in the opening, you have it, uh, you have some compensation for it. And your compensation very often um, consists of things like time or the possibility to attack your opponent's pieces or so on. And you need to find stable squares for your knight. And if you don't do that, then you're going to end up with no compensation. So, you know, it's not as people often think, you know, if you've got the bishop pair, you won't you know, I've done that before. I've just forgot the bishop pair, opened up the position and then got mated because you, <laughs> you're not ready for it. And I mean, checkmate's a drastic outcome in this case. But yeah, I mean, it can be that 
the kind of conversation you have, such as here and such as the Queen C2 Nimzo, where the problem is that White's Queen is a little bit exposed, you need to open the position to exploit that, and you probably need to open the position to find good squares for the knights as well. So this is a nice, typical example, a bit like that, where it's really um, a good idea to last open the centre for black, even though he's the one with the knight pair. And I like that because I like anything which sort of goes against a stereotype view of mm. how these things work, and that is quite a nice... That's what I like about John Watson. He doesn't. <laughs> there aren't too many stereotype things. So it takes, takes, and White gets the king out. Uh, yeah. out to safety. Takes, takes. Centers all yeah. completely. Centers all gone. All gone. Bye bye, center. And then we got this B3 move, and this was where we saw it before. And when the center goes, development becomes incredibly important because it's, you know, there's not. There's, there's not these usual structural considerations. You don't have to think about how the development fits with the structure, but you do have to think about how the pieces are going to be attached. So here, having played B3 Black, now, as I said, Black needs to find moves which exploit the slight awkwardness of White's positions before White can consolidate, and then the bishop pair just means he's a bit better. So knight e4, I think, is very consistent with that. Yeah. And after queen f3, it's actually bye-bye bishop pair. So... Yeah, and after um, a 40-minute think. After a 40-minute think. 40-minute oh, think. 14 minute think. 40. 39 minutes oh, and 23 goodness. seconds. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I was looking at White's moves. Okay. No, yeah, yeah, for Black. Black well, it's always Black. good when Luke's opponent thinks for 40 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so it's a very interesting... I mean, it's also an interesting question whether White should have looked for a square for the Queen, which prevents Knight D2. But you can sort of see at a glance that those are slightly awkward. Squares like E3 may not be in other ways quite ideal so on the other hand you know luke's queen f3 took up 12 minutes as well yeah. none of these de these decisions you know after the game it'll look like they reached a quiet position but there's an enormous amount of thought going into just the process of getting there yeah okay so 92 so forces the uh, it's a very interesting moment to think for 40 minutes so mm -hmm. i guess what he's thinking about is whether white still has some kind of Serious initiative based on that bishop on c4. So it's difficult to see why this is going to be so promising for Luke. Yeah. Okay, so what did Luke play here? That's it. That's where we've got to. Well, that's where we are. Oh, God. Luke is okay. having a think. Luke is unusually having a think. Um, yeah, I can't say I'm sort of. I mean, it's not that I find the position uninteresting by any means, but I, I'm not that crazy about Luke's chances of proving an edge here. Now, I mean, once, you know, I'm thinking that the knight is attacked, but also black has a kind of, if black wants to play with bishop against a knight, black has the possibility of trying to play knight e5 as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we've got to kind of find a move that deals with both of those things. Now, I can imagine maybe after something like knight e3, knight e5, queen g3, knight takes c4, knight takes... You could argue that White's knight is sort of eyeing up squares like b6, maybe d6, and yeah. it's sort of good enough. Well, in theory, you like queen and knight against queen and bishop, don't you? Well, sort of. That's an actually that's another another um, another little another stereotype that John little stereotype has for you. <laughs> but I mean, I think that he and I. All right. Would... So tell me then. So in this position, would you prefer queen and knight against queen? And bishop? Well, I think. I mean, it's much less clear when there are other pieces on the board. So when there are rooks on the board. Yeah, uh, it's much more likely to be not necessarily because the rooks and the bishop could sort of get together and try and hassle the knight and take away the good squares. There's also structure to consider. I mean, I don't think if white has an advantage in the line I just described where to eat black takes on c4, yeah. it's a very, very minimal one. It's sort of it's like this, doesn't it? I suspect it's, you know, yeah, almost microscopic yeah. here. So <coughs> well, I had rather forgotten that... Uh, Black does need to defend b4 here because if Black didn't defend b4, I think White has the rather amusing knight b6 because the queen's covering b8. So the knight, you could go knight b6, rook a7, and then possibly queen b8 winning a rook. Ooh, it's got to be said. I mean, that's probably nonsense. Yeah. You've got to put it on the board anyway because you don't, so see, wait, that. What do you want? You don't queen? see that every day, do you? Really? Yes. Queen somewhere. Queen somewhere silly. Uh, actually, it's quite difficult to find a really silly square. H6 covers the threat and probably isn't a silly square. Oh, at all. Let's go somewhere like silly lights. Well, if you go to C1, then um, 
after knight b6, rook a7, rook c1 no. would be rather good as well. But let's just see that rook get trapped, just because that doesn't happen in real life. Yeah, all right. So I'm going to find a silly square. Yeah, find a silly square. Um, that's, that's quite hard to do, though. It's a hard, quite hard well, to C2 is probably the only one. Put it on C2, because it doesn't matter. We could also win a piece. We're just trying to yeah. see how we spear yeah. a rook in the most unusual yeah. manner. <laughs> and yeah, the, the only problem would be here. It's not going to happen, but it is funny. It's not going to happen, but the fact that it could happen is fairly unusual, I think. Yeah. I'm not sure I've ever speared a rook like that. <laughs> <laughs> but if anyone wants to give me one, I'd love to do it. So there you go. Okay, that's nice. All right. Let's However, see as we pointed out, most of the natural squares you would actually put your queen to prevent the threat. So h6 looks like an obvious candidate to me. Yeah. But okay. for all that, it may be that that is one of White's most logical ideas. And, you know, again, the fact that Luke has a risk free position with possibly a slight initiative alongside two teammates, one of whom has a great yeah. position and the other of whom has a safe position, already gives. Mm. I'm optimistic feeling about how the day might be going, but yes, okay. I, let's I, I want to say that with a great lot of, yeah. people, of course. Okay, Mickey, Mickey. Okay, let's go back to the start. Yes, D four. So yeah, Mickey playing very um. Okay, he played knight f6 and e6, looking like he's going to play a Nimzo Indian. Yeah. And then played d5 back into a Queen's Gambit. Okay. One reason you might do that might be if people have sort of slightly inconsistent things, like they play the Catalan against the Queen's Gambit, but they play three knight c3 for a Nimzo Indian. If you can spot that your opponent has some of those slight anomalies in the repertoire, that's sometimes a good idea to do that. But it may well just be that this is now what Mickey does. And he, you know, if he can provoke knight c3, uh, knight f3, he will. But otherwise, he's keeping the option of. I mean, he's certainly played plenty of Nimzos in his life in the public. Mm. It's just a lot of it's just keeping your opponent guessing with different options. The Queen's Gambit declined is, is sort of as solid as it was 100 years ago, really. Okay, h6. h6. castles and b6 so this is the classic position of the tartakova variation as i said this has been a big speciality of nigel's for many many years you know it featured in the fisher spassky match 72 it's been in whole it featured mm, sort of almost ad nauseum in some of the um I don't know. Ah, matthew wrote a book on this opening uh huh. Yeah, Karpov, Kasparov matches, all kinds of things. It's been it's been absolutely at the and it's and Nigel played lots of these and and showed a lot of interesting ways to go with black as well. So the main thing to say here is that if white takes on d5 immediately, black tends to take back with the knight. So one of the point and then and then if if the knight subsequently gets exchanged on d5, so now bishop takes e7 or probably bishop takes e7 first, although it may I can't remember if it matters, but queen takes and then. Knight takes e5, pawn takes. And in this kind of position, black usually uses b6 primarily to support c5. And the bishop more often ends up on e6 or something, supporting the d-pawn that way rather than b7. Yeah. So one of the points about white's all these moves where white finds some other move than taking on move 8, part of the point is to try to do this when the bishop's already committed to b7. But actually, what White ends up doing, as in this game, more often after Bishop B7, is some version where they're taking on F6 before they take on D5, and then trying to sort of either prevent Black playing pawn to C5, or you know, create some pressure on D5, which makes it less desirable to play pawn to C5. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so white here actually took on... Yeah, now d white takes on d5, now that black really has to take with the pawn, because taking with the bishop doesn't really, really work too well, I think. You want that bishop. I mean, the bishop on b7, you know, it's one of those... Well, it's not a bad bishop, but it's one of those bad bishops defend good pawn scenarios where actually, mm -hmm. you know, it's pretty handy to keep some pieces that are formally bad because you actually need them to defend your yeah. structure. 
and now white played b4 there were different ways of playing this one is you know um to allow black c5 but put quick pressure on d5 the other way is to play b i mean it's worth noting that this doesn't prevent c5 because white can't take twice because the knight on c3 is on freeze but i think yeah white certainly can't do that because that would lose a rook i think what white tends to do here is play something like rook b1 and my recollection is that there were a whole bunch of games um i think it was karpov and kasparov in their uh, in their probably in their match that went on and eventually got <laughs> cancelled because it had gone on for so yeah, long yeah, and all that was... scandal which i certainly don't want to get into now but you know this was one of the openings which was tested as far as i recall i think players play in both colors sometimes but it, there were a whole load of these and black sort of emerged kind of okay but white's a little better but black can mostly mm. hold a draw um i think not playing c5 seems to me a little bit more ambitious yeah okay. you're keeping the bishop pair you're um you know there's there's certain things white has to be careful of not doing you know if white pushes b5 prematurely then you're going to go c5 when it's a lot safer yeah another plan white sometimes plays for in these positions is to play e4 but that of course involves some risk as well because you're going to be taking on an isolated queen pawn so yeah, but it's quite a rich position. I can see why this one's been kind of reasonably popular for both sides for a lot of years. And Okay, so let's have a look a bit quicker through the next few moves because I think see where the next kind of structural action happens. Rook b1, knight d7, e4. So white's done a good job of preventing c5, but that's partly black's choice. Black's decided that keeping the bishop pair was more important than going... And now it's a question I'm not sure in this particular position whether white is planning a5. I'm sure there were some yeah, maybe, yeah. plans a5. Sometimes black can even play b5 if there's any prospect of getting a knight to c4 or something. But if there's not, I guess that could end up a bit depressing. So I suspect black's a5 move here is partly about that. Yeah, because if b5 now, I guess white could go a5 and stop the knight coming into b6. Sorry, so again, if 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 black goes b5, if black plays b5 now, they're just going to lose their pawn, just but, take it, yeah. Take it. But yeah, it's a, a, yeah, I'm not sure, but a5, 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 a5 makes sense, but it also it makes the b6 pawn a little bit weak. But on the other hand, you can imagine scenarios where white's a4 pawn could become weak as well. So it's sort of, I mean, in a sense, it's like a it's a lot, of, a lot of the time in chess it's trade-offs and this i would argue is a trade-off that just makes the position a bit more interesting it creates weaknesses on both sides but it also may be something that black basically has to do in order to to maintain his setup so takes rook takes yeah so takes it's happened and now rookie one which suggests to me at least that he's asking black to keep an eye on that e4 idea i mentioned you know, if you're going to go e4 at some point, rookie one's a pretty handy move to throw in. So, yeah, and Mickey did rookie eight. Yeah, keep an eye on it as well. Queen c2. So now, I guess the question is whether e4 here would actually be a bit unpleasant for Black. Um, one of the things about rookie eight, if if e4 does happen and Black ever takes, then I guess once you've played rookie eight, you need to be a little bit careful that might, White might go bishop c4 and then start trying to gain something against yeah. f7 you know that f7 pawn can become a little bit a target it's not easy to attack but you know it could make black and so i think e4 is a very plausible idea for white if it's white's move here and i guess mickey's c5 is partly motivated by preventing it yeah so he does c5 and of course the downside of c5 is this big square on b5 yeah which can't be defended by any pawns anymore. So it's a pretty nice outpost for a white piece. You know, you tend to think of knights first when you think of outposts, but I don't think knight b5 achieves anything very much. Bishop b5, on the other hand, pins that knight, thereby adds a bit of pressure to black's pawns. And I kind of, yeah, I mean, that's almost certainly the move that he would have anticipated, yeah. I think. Yeah. Um, rook d8. Just breaking that pin. Yeah, also, there may be some Queen F5 move for White, which might force Rook E8 as well. I mean, Rook D8, it's probably good to get it in first. 
rook ed1. So that move possibly threatens some idea with taking on... I'm not sure if he's taking on c5 yet, but it forces black to think about possible pressure against d5. That's a move which black needs to be kind of careful about because, I mean, it's, you know, you can see the point of trading the bishop on the good square. On the other hand, black is trading one of the defenders of his d5 pawn. Yeah. And, and given the, that white's sort of putting a little like pressure on that, yeah. You've got to be careful there is in I mean at the moment I think the fact that any d takes c5 will be met by queen takes pinning the knight on c3 probably means that there is enough you know defending of d5 going on and indeed if white takes on c5 at the wrong moment that's one way in which the initiative can easily switch but you know it's it Mickey will when he plays bishop c6 he will be aware that c5 now becomes even more important to keep a, a firm eye on. Yeah. Right, so white now plays h4. H4. Yeah, I kind of like that. It's the same sort of pawn formation we were talking about, you know, in in Ravi's Catalan yeah, game, you know, yeah, yeah, h4, yeah. h3, and, and, and king g2 being kind of reasonable improving moves if not too much is going on. But, of course, if, um, if the position suddenly opens up, then a move like h4 you can come to regret. There's more chance of this op position opening up than there was in the case of Ravi's game. I'm pretty sure about that. So White needs to be more cautious playing a move like h4 than he needed to be in, in Ravi's case. Knight f8. Oh, by the way, the other thing Black's pro well, White's probably trying yeah. to do with, with h4 is make sure that make it much more uncomfortable for Black to ever play g6 because then White can reply with h5. You know, Black might be yeah. very happy to reorganise that bishop with, for example, g6 and h5 yeah. and and just keep that keep just give us a bit more scope for that bishop on f6 to drop back um uh, because it could be good but in that case h5 would be quite awkward and right. then white's winning white's winning the f5 square by one means or other and that would be a very retrograde step for oh yeah yeah i don't like this so much. yeah i don't like it either so basically i think if white hadn't played h4 black would have seriously considered g6 but h4 pretty much rules it out i think so knight f8 makes sense. Coming to e6, putting pressure on white's d4 in return for the pressure going on on black's d5, I guess. Okay, queen b3. So that's another move, which is eyeing up d5 and also, you know, creating the possibility that d takes c5, queen takes doesn't lead to a pin which may, you know, enable white to deal with it much more comfortably. So it's very balanced, isn't it? This it is fairly balanced. Well, I, I think I slightly prefer white, but I know that these things can sort of swing fairly yeah. fairly quickly if white makes goes about it in the wrong way, Part, you know, partly because, well, I think here relative, it doesn't feel too unsafe for white here, but I... But, I think if you if you start getting too ambitious or yeah, so what, black that black and of, yeah, and try and take just take that h pawn or something, but you can't do it here. Okay, so, I mean now I don't think black can. I don't think black wants to play bishop takes b five very much. No, I mean may, I think in fact I think knight d takes b five simply wins the d pawn immediately. Sorry, knight d takes b five. Yeah, so here. Wins the deep pawn immediately. Yeah. White has three attackers and two yeah. defend there's only two defenders, and yeah, that doesn't look good at all. So I think that's what motivates the capture on d4. Yeah, okay. So Mickey takes off. Yeah. Stop that. Takes. Also, you know, having having taken on d4, okay, black now has an isolated queen pawn, but amongst other things the knight on f8 might come to, for example, e6 and c5. You know, there are squares. If, 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 black, if black's light squared bishop wasn't being exchanged off, then also knight e6 followed by a, a d4 pawn sacrifice can sometimes bring back, you know, bring real life to black's position. And, and that's the sort of scenario where white could regret something like the move h4. But I don't think that's very likely here because I think the fact that bishop on c6 can be exchanged for the moment gives white a kind of safety net for that kind of thing. 
Worth noting right now that white is threatening bishop takes c6 and the b-pawn hangs. I mean, the b-pawn hanging is one of the downsides of manoeuvring your knight from d7 to e6. So yeah, yeah. everything black does has to take account of all these different mini threats white has. Tonight. It'd be fine if you could give up the b-pawn and get the a-pawn back for it, but you can't. It would, especially if, you know, especially as if that rook became active by taking on a4, then h4 suddenly becomes, another again, an issue for yeah, white. Yeah. But okay, so he goes knight e6. Yeah. Rook d2. And then now queen c5. Okay. So then so this one defends tactically. Actually, sorry, I think I, I think I might have been slightly misleading just now because with the knight on e6, you're not actually threatening queen takes b6 because then the knight on c3 would hang. Yes. So yeah. black doesn't need a specific answer to that one right now. It's just sort of general pressure. Yeah, and, and and so Mickey goes yeah. there. I mean, this move could very well be, uh, it might, I haven't worked out, might be threatening d4, I'm not sure. But um, Black's, uh, White's next move certainly puts paid to that anyway. Yep. Okay. And... Um... So now Mickey actually takes on yes, d5. and it's worth pointing out that okay that relieves the pressure on d five because a takes would have been a blunder because of rook a three. I mean I don't think White wants to play a takes anyway because the b six pawn is but there were you know it, yeah. it's, this was this, if you wanted yeah. to keep the pressure on d five yeah. you can't do that because rook a three just wins the knight on c three yeah. uh, yes yeah, so there's that going on as well knight takes. Okay, so it's still it feels you know a lot has changed, but nothing has changed in that white has light pressure, which it feels like black is quite capable of soaking up. But I think that it requires now the fact that taking on d five will always be met by something against a four. So queen c six. Yeah. So maybe Mickey wants to bring this knight. Yeah, I think he would very much like to bring the knight to c five and possibly even e. Four, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But for the moment, knight c5 has issues for the a-pawn. So the question, I suppose, the first question is what happens if white takes on d5? Okay. So let's see it. So rook takes. And I think probably that rook takes... And now... Well, if Queen, queen, queen takes, takes loses the D A four pawn immediately, and I don't think that that's good. This would be a draw, right? Or, well, I right? assume so because well, Rook takes A four, and then well, I mean, if if the pawn was on H three, then I suppose White could try. No, I don't think they can even. I think I think you can't even take the B six pawn because Black has Rook B four in reply. And maybe just show that if rook d6 here. Okay, in this particular yeah. position, black could take the h pawn if he wanted to, but he could also play rook b4. And I think it's right to say that rook takes b6 is met by knight c7. And that wins material because the rook is also not defended by anything if it throws in a rook b8 check. So, you know, you're, you're losing the exchange whether your rook's on b6 or b8. That's true, isn't it? Looks like it, yeah. Looks like it's true. So that you know, that's sort of a an extra safety net for black in that position, I would have thought. So that doesn't look at all dangerous. But no. I just wanted to check rook takes d5 instead of queen takes because so here, yeah, here, here. And this is where knight c5 probably isn't the way because of rook d8 check and queen takes f7. So I think here black might be relying on the rook takes a4 tactic. Rook takes a4. And then the queen can't protect d5. And. Yeah. And, you know, black, the white isn't going to have some tactical takes, hit here because yeah. black has a rook a1 safety net as well and everything. And, well, I mean. Yeah. This looks like a draw, but it's not black in any danger, I don't think. Yep. So, so yeah, so I think Mickey, basically Mickey has everything covered. But yeah, so it all, looks pretty level. Looks pretty level, which again is very 
Which is fine, given how the rest of the match is Well, going. it's fine, and it's particularly fine, given the rest of the match. Yeah, I mean, you know, yeah. it's it's very, very, very difficult to beat 25, 60 players with black unless you take them yes. if, as long as they, they are trying to be solid. So if they want to take crazy risks, then, of course, it happens. But if they want to play solidly, then, you know, you kind of... You, you will have to take some risk. And if you're playing in a team context, then obviously what the other people are doing is a very important variable. So I think, you know, looking at the four games as a whole looks looks pleasant at the moment. Promising, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All righty. Should we have a quick look in at um, Scotland and Ireland? Yes. Yes. That would be good. Okay. All uh, right. Things about commentary. My coffee's gone cold, but I'm just drinking oh, it. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. So what's going on here? Oh, well. I, was, I was wanting to see um, Trisha against Freddie. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm just going to just see actually the, the rest of that match is there. Yes. Any... Okay. So it looks like Graham. It's reasonably balanced. Graham Morrison looks to be doing. I mean, just from the computer assessments, great. Gray Morrison looks like he might be pressing again a bit, but yeah, he's been having okay. a good tournament. Yeah. So this one is um, match again of two two young superstars, really. Uh, Trisha uh, for Ireland against Freddie for Scotland, and um, both very good junior talent players. And so, uh, what do you think of this? Um, well, Black's Kingside looks sort of potentially a bit vulnerable, of course, but um, you sort of think that there could be some pawn weaknesses on the white side if Freddie manages to consolidate somehow. I mean, there could be, it's very, very sharp because I, you know, I'm, I'm sort of inclined to look at crazy stuff already, like something which allow something which prepares a rook takes f7 sacrifice would be nice mm. so you might i mean this is completely knight. off the cuff without really looking very hard at the position but you might want to take a quick glance at something like knight h4 queen takes h4 rook takes f7 just to make sure that wasn't very strong yeah i think um, it's black's go is it oh sorry it's black's go okay that might be a threat <laughs> perhaps <laughs> i'm not sure or it may not it's not clear to me that Oh, it does actually. No, after rook takes f7, that does look very scary. I'm not sure if black has some other way of meeting knight h4, but the rook takes f7 bit because there's there's queen g7 to follow after king. Yeah, I don't know. It looks very dangerous. I have to put in a dummy move to put it on the board. Should I just put in like yeah, a5? put in the critical a5 and just see whether so knight here. Yeah. Queen takes, but it may be that the king just runs away. But I'm, it's not. This very is doing us everything. So here, and takes six. Six. King is seven. I assume. I think. I mean, rook f one checks in the position as well. So king f eight doesn't make any sense. King e seven, and now I don't know whether white has a. Because you know the uh, queen g seven check and bishop a two check can be met by rook d five. I think because we've you know white has given up so much that black can give yeah. some back but there might be a very strong move here i just haven't seen it yet well presumably yeah. there's not a very strong move if the engines to be believed there's probably a drawing <laughs> move but not a very strong move but, but you know you can see something like this is quite dangerous right Gawain's commenting that Trisha does love attacking. He's he's been well. Yes, this is, this, I mean she's played this game in very much the spirit of someone who loves attacking, and <laughs> I imagine she's quite enjoying herself. Um, Actually, we have a move now from Freddie that wasn't a five. Well, funny that a <laughs> five would have been rather <laughs> nonchalant, I think. Yes. Okay, so. This prevents queen um, g7 check in that variation, but actually wouldn't prevent, Does it prevent queen the whole h7 idea? check. I'm not 100% sure, not sure whether it prevents the whole thing. We could, I mean, there are moves like, okay. yeah, takes rook f7. 
Oh, so maybe far from prevent it, it may have kind of provoked it a bit. Um, king yeah. takes presumably queen g6, and now is there going to be a simple move like rook f1 or something, which is impossible to meet because of rook uh, f7 check? Okay, that That's would right. be unpleasant if that was the case. Yeah, maybe. Gosh. Oh, no. No. <laughs> no, because the black can move the rook and create the d8 square for the king here. <laughs> for a moment, that looked quite... That looked promising for a minute. Well, it, I mean, I didn't. I just didn't notice rook moves. I was also a bit minded by the computer, but the rook moves... Okay, so put the rook back and let's find a good move instead, because apparently white's winning here. So, well, queen h7 is plausible and probably is the move, because... Bishop a2 probably runs into the same objection that the king can run back to d8. So let's bring the king forward instead. Queen so what, this one, king. Queen H, I think that's the only way to force the king forward rather than backwards. Oh, no, it's not. That's a draw. Oh, this is too tricky. I don't know. <laughs> All right. Has Gawain seen anything devastating here? Uh, I, uh, I, yes, of course he has. Um, probably include queen h7 check first. Okay, that's... Yes. That's what we did, and that wasn't... That wasn't right. <laughs> um, presumably, there's a good reply to Bishop F5 because it just feels like there ought to be, but I haven't actually seen one yet. <laughs> Go in, suggest the same as us. What, Bishop F5? <laughs> no, no, no. Um, the, the... Yeah, Bishop F5 is devastating because if Rook along the D file, Queen E6 check, King D8, Queen C8, and then Queen C7 is mating, which is rather. Weird, but true. So go on, rook. So well, rook, rook somewhere, d2, say, get some counterplay. Yeah. Queen e6, king d8, queen c8 check, and unusually, queen c7 seems to be mating. Ooh. That's nice. That is nice. Well, nice for... Nice, nice for Fisher. <laughs> A bit miserable <laughs> for Freddy. Um, so... Yeah, that's interesting. Well, it's not obvious. It's hard I mean, to see all that, though, isn't it? Without it's a... very hard to see all that. But I don't think I think if you're a player with good attacking instincts like she has, yeah. it's where you're focusing. Yeah, it's where yeah. your mind goes to first. Is trying to get make this knight h4 work because if black can consolidate, I think there are things yeah. to like about Freddie's position. But yeah. So she okay. will be looking. It's just a question of whether she can find the detail of that. Yeah, if you don't find the detail, if, if, you, if you have a drawing line, it helps you to play it and then find the detail halfway through. If you don't have a drawing line, and I haven't, I'm not sure yet whether Queen H7 drew, but it may do. But if you if you have a drawing line, you can sort of play it and then find it halfway through. But if you don't, yeah. you have to calculate much more at the beginning, and that makes it an awful lot harder. So oh, she hasn't played it though. Oh, uh, that would as I. But as I said, once you don't play it, then Black's position starts to look a bit more yeah, reasonable. So he's gone night that way. Oh dear, that doesn't look so good. Um, I mean, if she takes on e five, I assume rook f seven is at least still a bit dangerous. But maybe the trick is that Black plays something like queen d two, and then I know, but there's no sufficient sub because there's rook. oh there. I went insane. Yeah, no, that looks dangerous. Queen d2, I expect, might be the move. Queen d2 instead. No, no, I don't understand yet because after queen d2, rook takes f7, queen takes c2, white can take on f8. And then it's not. So queen d2. Rook takes f7. And now is there some reason why this is a bad idea? Um, um, well, let's assume you take the queen. Yeah, then I thought rook takes f8. As long as you take back on c2 with the bishop, might be okay. okay. But maybe not. Maybe it's just yeah. white's pieces are so ugly here that the take two pieces for a rook is bad. I mean, it's quite... Two pieces for a rook in the ending is a tricky thing, and if the what if the minor pieces are a bit iffy like they are here, maybe it's you could do this one, threatening to take on c two. You could. I, I, then you have to calculate bishop takes g six, I suppose. Although, you know, black has a bunch of queenside pawns, but I'd be surprised mm. if that was very clear. Yeah. 
I don't know. That's a strange line. I mean, it 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 may be that that's quite a difficult judgment call for a young player to make. You know, to know whether that rook against two mm -hmm. pieces is so. It anyway, could, be, it it could it. be that the sufficient to puts him off queen yeah. take to queen d two, even if it shouldn't. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. Freddie's very, gone queen d two. Okay, so maybe it hasn't put him off. I mean, it feels like the move you want to play if it works, but. Exciting, yeah. It is exciting, isn't it? Maybe, maybe yeah. she's just going to play something like knight g4, but in that case, I kind of think the long-term advantages in his position will probably start to tell a little bit. Yeah. Well, like bishop pair and extra pawn. Well, yeah, and, well, the extra pawn and... The, I mean, you know, if the e5 pawn doesn't prove to be an asset, then it could prove to be weak as well. Yeah. But she, I mean, he, she may well have to play some knight f6 check after that, but that sort of lets the black rooks in quite a lot as well. I think there's a danger that she slightly missed her moment there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so quite a moment it was too, actually. It's yeah, a, no, it's it's a nice knight h4. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. All right. Well, interesting so, stuff. And it'll be interesting to see whether he goes, uh, whether, sorry, whether she goes for rook takes f7 anyway. Yes. And, and, um, but we can come back. And one of quite, it's, it's very few, isn't it? Women in the open event. Um, Ireland has. There are a others. Do you know if there are others? I, I don't know if there are others. But anyway, yes. So it's great. I'm very, it's very glad to see one. I mean, obviously, the yeah. Ireland doesn't have a women's team anyway, but I, I'm yes. full of admiration for women playing in the open section in general. I think it's a very positive thing. Yes. Okay. Um, we're going to have a look at the women's section. So we haven't seen the um, English women in detail yet, except for show That is true. I think I might, it might be a good moment for me to take my break five minute break. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We're going to take a five minute break and uh, we'll, we'll be back soon. shortly. I'm going to, I'm going to just end the stream here and then start again up in five minutes. Thanks all for watching so far. Yep. Thank you very much. See you soon.